Well, thank you so much for joining this broadcast. I believe you're going to be touched as we teach on finances today. I would encourage you to go and get the previous two sessions on finances. And I realized that the more we study grace, the grace of God, the more we realize that it can be applied to every area of our lives, including finances. In the previous two sessions, we've laid the foundation on how to study any topic in the Bible. The greatest way to study any topic in the Bible is take the foundation of the cross of Jesus Christ and then from there to study everything. So if we want to study healing, we take the cross of Jesus Christ and say, well, this is what the message of the cross says. The cross says by the works of Jesus Christ, we are healed, saved, delivered and everything. And then from that perspective, we see how Jesus did it all so that we can be healed then if you study healing. If you study um, peace, then we take the cross of Jesus Christ and we say, let's have a look at what Jesus Christ did so that we can have peace in this world. Um, through His obedience to the law, through His obedience to the Father, through His de death and resurrection, we have a look at what He has done so that we can have peace by simply believing in what He's done. And if we take that principle we can apply it to every area of life and find the grace of God in every area of life. You know, there are many people that think that the grace message is a license to sin. Now, if you think the grace message is a license to sin, then you must interpret John chapter 1, verse, um, I think it's 14 or 17, where it says, and we beheld this glory full of grace and truth. You must interpret in a way that says, and we beheld His glory full of a license to sin and truth. Grace is not license to sin. Grace is the power of God into the lives of people. That is what the grace of God is. And so many times people make the grace of God a license to, to sin and teaches the grace of God as a license to sin. Now, the scripture in Jude chapter 1 verse 5 and 6 says that there are some people that teach us the grace of God as a license to sin. It doesn't speak of people preaching grace. It speaks of people preaching and saying that grace is a license to sin. That's what it talks about. So let's be very careful when it comes to accusations, when it comes against the grace message, because to be against the grace of God is being against God Himself and being against the plan of Jesus Christ. Amen. So um, let's be very, very careful when it comes to accusations against the message of love, the message of mercy, the message of grace. It's the very mercy of God, the very grace of God, His love and His goodness that makes God different to anybody else. The word holy means to be separated um, from or to be set apart. Now, the, what makes God holy, if we can use, I'm using human terms, you can, can't actually say these words, but to make God holy, or what makes God holy, is the fact that He is merciful. Because other gods aren't merciful with the mercy that God has. Not that there is any other God, but, um, I mean, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the most merciful, the most powerful God that there could ever be because He has shown His love in the way that He has shown it through Jesus. So, when we make our study concerning finances, we are doing it from the perspective of the cross, from the perspective of the obedience of Jesus Christ. We want Jesus Christ and, um, you know, what He's done in every word, in everything, in every sentence that we speak when it comes to any area of study in the Bible. Now, um, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 14 and um, the whole story about Abraham in the previous study. We looked at um, the Melchizedek and what it says in the New Testament and the conclusion we came to is this. We don't worry about finances because God says that He will care for us and that is enough to cover um, everything. He says, listen, I've got you covered. I'll care for you concerning finances. All you do is seek my righteousness. Now, that's the righteousness of God. It doesn't say seek your righteousness. It says seek the righteousness of God. In other words, how righteous is God? How righteous is Jesus? How righteous is Jesus concerning finances? Let's seek that out. And it says when we seek that out, then we will find that all our needs are met. It's included. God will bless us all the time because He is a Father. 
So we can clearly see that the blessing rests in who God is. Now we're going to get more into that when we go into the Gospels and study the teachings of Jesus concerning finances. But just to have that as a foundation, we know for sure that we don't have to worry about our finances. In this study, you know, we can open our mind and say, well, let's put everything aside, everything I've been taught all the time, tithing, sowing and reaping, don't worry to give, give, whatever you've been taught, we put it aside and we're going to study from a grace perspective. What we also saw in um, Hebrews chapter 7 is that it says that um, the tithing principle, tithing and giving was part of the Levitical priesthood. It was part of the Levitical priesthood and it was given as a law. And then when the priesthood changed, there was also of necessity a change of law. So th that means that we don't relate to God on the basis of the law of Moses or anything we must do. But we relate to God on the basis of Jesus Christ as our high priest. And that whole story came from Abraham and Melchizedek, which was written down in Genesis chapter 14. And so many times um, we've, or we've been taught in the typical charismatic setting that the tithing was way before the law of Moses. And yes, people did give 10% or Abram gave a tithe long before the law. But that doesn't mean that the tithing principle or if you give then God's going to bless you that it's not part of the law. Everything we got on tithing um, these days and what we know is you give to the priest 10% of this and that and that's how you should give it and then you should sow on top of that. All of those type of teachings is taken from the Levitical priesthood and that's where, it is, where we get it. So we can't take that. You know, we can't look at it that way. We must have a cross perspective. Now let's go and have a look at Genesis. And we, um, this is going to be a very interesting stu study. And it can be shocking to you what I'm going to say to you today. Now, today we're going to speak on Abraham. Tomorrow I'm going to look at the first implementation of the tithe and what it was for. What, it w what you had to um, basically give and how it worked. So if we want to apply it according to the Levitical way we can go and have a look at how it is correctly applied and then we'll have to do it that way. Right, Genesis 14. Now I need to give you a little bit of background on Genesis 14 so that you can know what's going on here. Now there was a king, um, Sidi Laomer, and he was the king of Elam. Now Sidi Laomer um, also had people under him that was like slaves and he oppressed them and he, he had them for I think it's 12 or 13 years he oppressed them and then in the 13th or 14th year, they rebelled and broke free. Then Sidulai Omer went and he made war with other kings again. And then these kings that broke free went and made war again with Sidulai Omer because they just had this grudge in their hearts against him and they didn't want him to even uh, uh, gain more ground, even, even if it wasn't towards them but others. And I think, yeah, yeah not I think, there was these slime pits and because of this, the people struggled to war against him, and they lost. Now, what happened then was, Lot, the brother of Abram, was part of those people, and he was also caught um, when Sidi Lahomer took people captive and ran off with him. And then, I mean, Sidi Lahomer also took the goods of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and some other kings. So, what Abram did was, he took the servants that he had, and he said, let's go and hunt this guy down, see the Lomer, and let's go and get Lot back. So what he did was, he, he went to war, and he um, did beat, he conquered see the Lomer, got everything, and that was now the, the spoils that they got from um, Sodom and Gomorrah. So here was Sodom and Gomorrah, the, they were defeated by see the Lomer, Abram went, made war with Sidi Lomer, got the goods back. You know, but now the goods belong to Abram, because Abram won the battle. And now it is actually his stuff, because he took it off um, from Sidi Lomer. Now, we're going to pick up the story when he comes back after the battle. In, um, I think it's verse 14. Sorry, it's verse 17. Verse 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, 
born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them and his servants by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto um, Ho Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So he got everything, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Sidelomer, and the kings that were with him at, at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. So what happens here? Here comes the king of Sodom and other kings, you know, because, I mean, he's beaten this guy and now got all these other kings that was too scared to go to war and that couldn't uh, conquer Sidelomer. He got all their goods back as well. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, so here comes a guy, he's king of Salem, which is today called Jerusalem, um, and he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, who has delivered thine enemies in thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Now, listen to this. This is very, very important. Dear Abram comes, he conquers. Why did he conquer? Because of the blessing of God. Here, come, here comes all the kings. And they say, man, Abram, you've beaten these, guy, these guys. And what was the words of the representative of Jesus, if you were going to call it that way, the type of Christ, called, in this case, Melchizedek. Melchizedek came in the order of, of which Jesus Christ came now, so we can see him as Jesus. And he came, and what was the first thing he did after Abraham got a lot of wealth? Did he command 10%? Did he ask anything? No, he did not. He did not command 10%. He never asked anything. He never demanded anything from Abraham at all. He just came and gave even more unto Abraham and blessed him with bread and wine. So here comes all the kings. The king of Sodom is there. And we're going to look at him right now. The king of Sodom wants his goods back. So he, he actually wants back what Abraham won because it was his people. You know, it was his family, his people. Abraham could have taken them for slaves if he wanted to. It was his, 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 his right. I mean, he won the battle. It belongs to him now. Now, here comes Sodom. I want the people. I want this. This king wants that. That king wants that. But what does Melchizedek do? Melchizedek gives him even more. And that is the nature of God. The nature of God is when you get something, to give you even more. It's what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. What shall we do since God has blessed us in such a way? We will lift up our cup and drink to the salvation of the Lord. It means we will just receive more of what He has done for us. So here it comes, and, and, and Melchizedek, after Abraham won the battle, came and gave him bread and gave him wine, speaking of the body of Jesus Christ. You know, but let's forget about that for the moment. He blessed him with stuff, because Abraham didn't know this is the body of of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. He just knew this guy blessed me with some wine. Say he gave him in today's times three loaves of nice homemade bread and 12 bottles of wine. He just blessed, blessed him and said, man, I bless you and I've got a word from God for you. Blessed are you, O Abraham, for God has delivered these enemies into your hand and blessed is the God that has delivered them into your hand. Now, that is the word of God when you receive finances. The word of God towards you is you are blessed. This was God that gave it to you. And there was no demand made whatsoever from, Mel from Melchizedek's side. He was the king of Salem. He was the priest of God. That he should, Abram should give him a thing. Nothing. And he, Melchizedek speaks of the reign of Jesus Christ. It speaks of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So, in today's terms, if you get blessed, if we take this to the New Testament, to your life today, say you, you've got this massive business deal and it went through and you're now blessed. And I come as a priest of God and I, say, I'll, I have to say these words, let me serve you with bread and wine, let me give you something. And then speak the word of God over you. Say, listen, this is in the body and the blood of Jesus and you are blessed. 
of the Most High God. Say your name is Peter and you've got a lot of money. I must say to you, when a business deal goes through, I must say as a pastor or a leader, I should say to you, Peter, blessed are you of the Most High God who has given you this business deal and blessed is God who has given this unto you. And man, I want to just say to you, this is in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't God good? I'm so glad that you are blessed with, and then I should say that with true joy in my heart, without having my eye upon the money the guy got so that I can see what I can get out of it. Because that was not the, 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 the attitude of Melchizedek. So if we come in Jesus Christ to people, we can't as leaders have that mentality, well, this guy got this business deal. Well, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get something. And then we come with a gift of hints and try and see, you know, you know what, you know, we need a new this and, you know, the carpet of the church and, you know, we, we need new lighting and, you know, just a gift of hints there just to get something out of him and make a deal with him and say, you know, if you give this, then you can have that, that type of thing, as if it belongs to you. No, God blessed the guy and it's his stuff. That's as simple as what it is. And then comes the king of Sodom. Let's look at the king of Sodom and his way in dealing with Abram and, and how he, he spoke to Abram. It says, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. So here he comes and he says, Listen man, everything that, that you got, basically all the city and everything there was, was taken away. And he says, listen, just give me the people. Give me a little bit, but you take the rest. Now that sounds like a teaching that, that, that we've heard these days so many times, you know. It's like saying, give me a little part and you can keep the rest because it actually belongs to me. The king of Sodom must have felt, you know, all that stuff belongs to me. Actually, it was stolen from me. Now Abram won it back. Not wanted, he won it in the war. He conquered Cedar Lahomer, got the stuff back. Now it's actually Abram's. But now the king of Sodom must have felt, you know, this actually belongs to me. And so many times today, there's a teaching that says everything you own actually belongs to God. And that you now can keep a lot of it if you just give a certain part back to God. Now that is under the kingship or rulership, that type of thinking um, that, that, comes, that, that, that comes from Sodom. Now, you might say, oh, Bertie, you are saying that the teaching of tithing is from Satan. I'm not saying the teaching of tithing is from Satan. There was a place for it under the Old Testament. But under the New Testament, if you think that you're going to prosper by your giving or tithing according to what we interpret here into the cross of Jesus Christ, we are seeing that it's not God's way. Now, let's go to Revelations. Chapter 11, and we're going to read there. from verse 8. Now, this speaks of two prophets that was in the streets prophesying, you know, and then they were eventually killed and their bodies lied in this great city. And this great city was called um, ba uh, Babylon, you know, in, and Babylon speaks of certain things. And uh, let's see what it speaks of. And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Now, where's that? That is Jerusalem, and that speaks of Sodom, which speaks of the law system under which Jesus Christ was crucified. That was it. So the death Jesus died, He died under the accusation of the Lord towards us, and then He took that upon Himself, and that's where He died. So Jesus died under the law system, not guilty, but taking our trespasses against us, because the law was taken, and then judgment came according to that law. The judgment of the law, God's judgment through the law, came upon the body of Jesus, where? In Jerusalem, which is also called Egypt, which is also called Sodom. Okay? Now, which was called the great city, Babylon. And that Babylon speaks of the Babylon and Sodom and Egypt and the law system, Jerusalem. And I'm not talking about the Jerusalem that's from above. I'm talking about this Jerusalem today, you know, where Jesus Christ is actually rejected. Um, it speaks of the law system. The reason why I say that is um, 
it speaks of the great city Babylon where the Tower of Babel was, which was man's effort to build a tower to reach the level of God. So the law system is man's effort to reach God. So under the system of Melchizedek that says you are just blessed of God, you haven't done anything good to get this, you are just blessed of God, Abram, and God is good that has blessed you. That system is what I call the New Testament system. Where Abram then, out of the abundance of his heart and of gratitude, gave freely, out of abundance of his heart, to um, Melchizedek. And it's only recorded that he gave once. And then Jacob came, and he came after that. Jacob came and he said, God, if you, your word is true, the promise that you've made, that you'll bless me like this in everything, then I'll give you a tithe of everything. So the principle was your God first blesses me and if I just feel like it, then I can give a tithe. That's it. To me, that is what, if you want to interpret it into the New Testament, that's the way it works. God comes and He decides to bless you because He's a good God. And you realize that this is because of the goodness of God. And this king, the king that comes to you doesn't demand anything from you. He just blesses you even more. And out of that comes abundance to give. But the king of Sodom, the king of the law system, the king of um, have righteousness by your works, man's effort to be blessed. He says, give me 10% and I'll give you something. Now I know that's radical and, can t and it will shake a legalistic mind so much. We must realize that even if the law was given by God, it was not implemented by God. And you can go and listen to my series in www.dynamicministries.com on the fulfillment of the law and see where it actually comes from. It was implemented by Adam, which is the law is actually a system that says it's man's effort to reach the righteousness of God. And whatever commandment you want to put in there, you can put in there. And then God gave the law in written format so that people could see their sinfulness and see their inability to reach the level of God. And then if, even at the Tower of Babel when God came down, it says, and God confused their language. And I want to say this to you. So many times I've seen if you pre preach in a place or share with people that's legalistic, they say, no, but you confuse me. And now I know God is not the author of confusion like the Bible states. So the righteousness message doesn't bring confusion, but the law message in the presence of God brings confusion. So when the grace message is taught, but you're in a legalistic mindset, you might feel confused. But if you feel like that right now, go and say, God, show me this. Man. Show me the truth about what, 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 you show, what, what you are talking in the scriptures concerning grace and the cross and finances. So we don't want to preach a system that says, um, that talks about the law system, that talks about Sodom. The law system, the system of works, says, or is, is um, typified by Sodom and Gomorrah. Egypt, the law system, Jerusalem, Babel, the Tower of Babel, and all those things. So, we must make sure that when we preach a tithing message or when we preach finances, we can't go from the perspective of Sodom. Give me this, but you can keep that. But let's just see what Abram said. And Abram said unto the king of Sodom, or unto the law system, I have lifted my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. In other words, he's actually confessing and saying, listen man, I am in covenant with God, the possessor of heaven and earth. So he owns everything anyway. I've lifted up my hand to him that I will not take from, from a thread even to a shoelace and that I will not take anything that is yours lest you would say, I have made Abram rich. So what I believe is, you know, boasting comes in human ability. Under the king of Sodom, human ability, what I've done, look what I've done, I've made you rich, the law has made me rich, the man's effort has made me rich, you know, to be blessed. He said, I will not partake of that system that says, well, I'll give you a bit and you give me much. I will not partake of that system. But because I am already in covenant with God that owns everything. Now, what he says is, coming, I've lifted up my hand unto him. That just means, in, in, in the way I interpret this is, I've sworn unto God, God, you're the one that makes me rich. And that's it. So, if we can just get that 
in our minds and realize, listen, man, there's two systems in the Bible. It's clearly seen here. And we can't take the system where, where Abram gave 10% and say, well, you know, he gave a bit back and now he can keep the rest. No, that's the Sodom way of doing. That's the law way of doing. That is the man's way to reach wealth. And I want to say this. We should come to a place where we clearly say and clearly state that we're not going to say that the law makes us rich. We're not going to say, by my efforts, I've been made rich. By the law of Moses, I've been made rich. But we want to lift our hands to Melchizedek or to the possessor of heaven and earth, God Almighty, and say, God has just blessed me. Do you know that the story of God and Abraham is not an Abraham story, but it's a God story? It's not about Abraham and what he did to possess wealth. It's all about God choosing a man, just any man, and out of the goodness of his heart, decide to bless a guy, and that's it. That is what this story is about. It's not about how Abraham was a faithful tither and how God blessed his tithing. It was all about how God could decide to bless anybody. Because that's the New Testament concept of um, relationship between man and God. The concept is God blesses anybody and His righteousness and His love is towards everybody and whosoever believes has got access into that. That's what it says. Now let's read that quickly. We've got three minutes left. But let's just read that quickly. If I can find that. Um, in Romans chapter 4. And this is the message translation, and in the next session we will pick it up there again. Romans chapter 4. It says, So how do we fit what we know of Abraham, our, fir our first father in the faith, into this new way of looking at things? If Abraham, by what he did for God, got God to approve him, he could certainly have taken credit for it. But the story we... Uh, we're given is a God story, not an Abraham story. What we read in Scripture is Abraham entered into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. <laughs> this is wonderful. The turning point in Abraham's life was what? When he was entering into what God was doing for him, and he was not trying to do something for God to be set right with God. So we are not going to try and do something right for God to be set right with God. Because God doesn't come in the authority of Sodom, or Babel, or Babylon. God comes to us in the authority of Melchizedek, or in the order of Melchizedek, which is, I bless you for free, and once you're blessed, I'll even give you more on top of that, and pronounce um, another blessing on top of that. Man, that is the, the almost too good to be true news called by the Apostle Paul, the Gospel. Amen which Jesus Christ died for, which we can have authority to enter into if, we, if you can find it in your heart as you hear this to believe it. Amen. So what we've got today is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Ne let's never again take the story of Abraham and make it an Abraham story, for it's not an Abraham story, it is a God story. When it comes to finances and your blessing, let it be a Jesus story and not a John, Mary, and Joe story. Let it be a Jesus story. When you prosper, let it be the cross of Jesus Christ story. Let it not be your faithfulness story. Let it not be your tithing story. Let it not be your sowing and proclaiming the seed and naming the seed and whatever story. Let it be a God story. And you will see that the power of God manifests in that God story. Because the turning point came in Abraham's life. When? This is according to the message here. It says the turning point came when Abraham entered into what God was doing for him and that he was that was a turning point he trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own I want to tell you the grace way in finances is not trying to be set right with God by giving money but it is trusting that God has set you right in Jesus Christ
Hallelujah. Remember one thing. You, can't, you cannot just listen to one of these messages and then just leave it there. You must listen to all of it to get the good balance um, in what we are saying. So, man, thank you that you've watched this. I've really been blessed by this myself now. You know, and I just feel this encouragement in my heart knowing that God always prospers us. We're going to go over to the song as we play out. And thank you that you've joined this broadcast. Tell your friends. Forward this to somebody. Know this will also be available in dynamicministries.com. God bless you.